talk to you today about why we matter. And the question is, really, I mean, do I matter? Does my voice matter? Does my place in the world really matter? I mean, after all, I'm just one person out of billions and billions, this tiny speck of dust on this giant planet. And do I really matter? Well, in 1963, a man by the name of Edward Lorenz attended the New York Academy of Science, and he had this idea. His idea was that a butterfly in China could move its wings and move molecules of air. And those molecules of air would move other molecules of air. And there would be enough molecules of air that were moved that it could create a hurricane or a tornado in New Mexico. And of course, he was laughed at. And poor Edward had to go home with his tail between his legs, and he was slightly embarrassed. But 30 years later, it became a law. The law of sensitive dependence upon initial conditions. What that meant was that a single action could cause a reaction on the other side of the world far beyond this moment and this time. And it became part of the chaos theory. Now, I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to talk to you about butterflies. Because other than the fact that I really think they're pretty, I don't know anything about butterflies. And I'm not going to talk to you about weather patterns, because I really, really don't know anything about weather patterns at all. But I do want to talk to you about why we matter. And I'm going to tell you a story to illustrate why your first movement matters. Part of the original part of the chaos theory. And to illustrate that, I'm going to tell you a story. In 1984, there's a young girl. She's 22 years old. She's attending a small college in a small town in North Carolina. Now, she's doing all the right things, OK? She's dating the right guy. He's in med school. She's working two jobs because she wants to be an independent young woman and pay her own bills. She's studying really, really hard. She's maintaining a 4.0 GPA. And she's doing so well that she's actually been invited to attend another university for a master's program as a teaching assistant. She's going to graduate summa cum laude. She's going to be valedictorian of her class when she graduates. Now, it's July of 1984. She's going out with her boyfriend. They play tennis, they go to dinner. Later that evening, she becomes violently sick. And she asks her boyfriend to please take her home, and he does, and he's very polite about that. Her last memory of that night is her boyfriend giving her some aspirin as he leaves to go home. Sometime around 3 o'clock in the morning, she hears a noise in her apartment. She lives alone. She struggles to wake up. She's trying to figure out if the noise is actually real or not real. She feels something brush against her arm. She looks to the side of her bed. She sees the top of someone's head. She thinks this might be her boyfriend, but she realizes there's no way it could be her boyfriend. He never spent the night with her. She says, who is it who's there? And at that moment, a strange man jumps on her bed as she screams. He straddles her body, puts a gloved hand across her face and a knife to the left side of her throat, and he says, shut up or I will kill you. Now again, in these moments, she's struggling to try to figure out what's actually happening to her. Is this a joke? Could this possibly have been a break-in? She startled him. She offers him her car, her, her, her credit cards, her cash. Please, she says, don't hurt me. I won't call the police. You don't have to do this. And he says to her, I don't want your money. And at that moment, it becomes crystal clear what's getting ready to happen to her. She knows. She knows she's going to be raped. She knows this. What she doesn't know, though, is will she die? Is this the last face that she'll see before she leaves this earth? Is this the last Thing that will touch her skin before she dies. And she wonders to herself, how will it feel when I die? Will it be fast? Will I not know? 
Will it just be over with and I'll just be dead? Or will it be slow? Will he beat me? Will I die slowly? Will I feel it? Will it be painful? And then she starts picturing her mother and her father. And she wants to tell them one more time before she dies, I love you. Thank you. And then something happens. She realizes that, you know what? I may die, but it won't be on my back. That there's a way to survive. I'm smart and I can figure this out. And she begins to formulate a plan. And her plan is this, live. Remember everything about this person as he's raping you and then help the police find him. Over the next 20 minutes as her body becomes a toilet and she's assaulted, she begins to look in his face. In those moments and those glimpses of light, she begins to memorize the shape of his eyes, his voice, his nose, his hairline, everything about his face because she will live and she will see him rot in hell. She pulls a blanket off the edge of her bed at one point. She says, please, um, I'm afraid of knives. Please take the knife outside and if you do that, I'll let you come back in. And he believes her. Her plan is to somehow get to the bathroom and escape through the window. When she gets to the bathroom, she realizes she can't fit through the window. It's too small. She's got to rethink her plan. She remembers at that moment, he said he had come through my kitchen door. I must get to the kitchen door. Can I please get a drink of water first, please, before we do this? And he says, yeah, I make me a drink and we'll have a party. She makes her way to the kitchen. She pulls her blanket tight. She's making noise, and she runs. It's 3.30 in the morning. It's raining. The grass is slippery. She doesn't know where she's going to go. He's chasing her through the dark. Her only plan is to somehow find light, find safety. Maybe somebody will discover me. Somebody will save my life. She ends up in a carport. The family happens to be home as she's screaming, and they let her in. And she's quickly taken to the hospital, where her body now is a crime scene and the body must be processed because the evidence now is on her and in her and it's got to be collected and put into Ziploc bags and it's there she learns that he had left her apartment and had raped another woman down the street and she could hear the woman crying down the hallway in the emergency room and she hates him she wants to kill him the police ask her if you got a good look. Yes, I did. Please, I want to help you. And she begins to help them come up with a description, which results in a composite sketch, which results in a suspect. She's called to the police station. She's able to pick him out of a photographic lineup. She's able to pick him out of a physical lineup. His name is Ronald Cotton. Ronald Cotton would be arrested. He would be tried in January of 1985 after two weeks of court he would be found guilty of first-degree rape, first-degree sex offense, first-degree break and entering, and he would be sentenced to life in 54 years. And then they would pat her on the head and they would say, now you get to put your life back together again. You can move on, you can move forward. But she knows she can't because her life is over. See, her boyfriend doesn't want to marry her now because well, she needs a lot of support and her friends don't really want to hang out with her because she cries a lot and she can't go to class the next day because she couldn't go to bed the night before because she can hear him coming up the steps. She can feel him underneath the bed. He's there every night and the only way she can get through the days and the nights is with drugs and alcohol. And so she does. And she consumes so much drugs and so much alcohol that by April of 1985, she's almost dead. She struggles to recover. She graduates. She gets a job. She falls in love again. She's married in 1988. In the fall of 1989, she gets pregnant. And the spring of 1990, she gives birth to triplets. <laughs> Two little girls and a baby boy, these rewards, right? This thing, this task, this job. She's got a direction. She's got purpose. She matters. 
until 1995 when she gets a phone call from the investigator from the crime and he says, hey, there's this thing called DNA. Have you heard of it? Yes, she says. Well, Ronald Cotton, after 11 years, says he's innocent. Well, we know he's not, but your DNA, your blood sample from your rape kit is disintegrated. You'll have to submit to a new blood test, to which she says, take my blood, run the test. I've got five-year-old children. I can't do this again. She gives them the blood, the test goes to the lab. Three months later in her kitchen, they stand and they tell her, it's not Ronald Cotton's DNA, it's Bobby Pools, a serial rapist who had terrorized the city, who had raped six more women, who had created a lot of harm and trauma and she's left with this. And once again, her life is now tattered and shredded like the aftermath of a hurricane. And there's pieces of her everywhere. And she's trying to pick up those pieces and make sense of it. So for the next two years, she becomes depressed and debilitated and paralyzed with depression and fear and anger and shame and guilt. What do I do with this, she thinks. And so she makes a decision. I need to meet Ronald Cotton. And so in a small church, a mile and a half from where she had been raped 13 years before, she waits for this man to come into the room and she sees him and she's crying and she says, Mr. Cotton, if I spent every second of every minute of every hour of every day for the rest of my life telling you I'm sorry, could you ever forgive me? And he takes her hand and he cries and he says, I'm not angry at you. I forgave you years ago. We were both victims of the same person. We were both victims of the criminal justice system. Now, by now, you've probably figured out that girl was me. That initial movement changed my life. It changed Ronald's life. It changed Detective Galden's life. But much like the aftermath of a hurricane or a tornado, two things happen, right? We either say, forget it, I can't rebuild, I walk away, or we put what we can back together again and we become our better angels. I had a decision to make. For the next 20 years, I'd find myself on stages, much like this, telling my story, burying myself, and what I would find in those 20 years is the stories of the men and women who had been wrongfully convicted, the men who had been walking to the store to get sweet potatoes for their grandmother only to be released to freedom 27 years later, the mothers who would be accused of abusing their children and be separated from their children only to come home and their kids were grown, the moms and the dads who had lost years, their lives had been interrupted and they didn't make memories with their families because their sons or daughters were incarcerated for crimes they had never for committed. They were children. They were siblings. And I would collect these stories. I would collect stories from the original survivors about what those years had been like and who killed my child. And I kept waiting for the system to fix itself. I kept waiting for the criminal justice system to claim responsibility and it wasn't happening. So in 2015, I took a leap of faith. I started the first national nonprofit that addresses the aftermath of wrongful convictions to everyone that gets harmed, from the crime survivor and their families to the exonerees, their families, to the police, prosecutors, judges, jurors, everyone who gets impacted, and to the other crime survivors 
who are harmed when we've left the true perpetrator on the street. And the idea was fairly simple. I thought, gosh, if Ronald Cotton and I can engage in restorative justice practices and we can become friends, what would it look like if I brought these folks together? What would it look like if we sat in circles and we leaned in and we shared our stories and mothers got to hear the stories of the siblings and the siblings heard the stories of the crime survivors and the children got to witness the stories of the exonerees. What would it look like if we engaged in collective resilience? What would that be? How would it look if we began to unfold that grief? Could we heal as a community? And the answer was, yes, we can. We can laugh again. We can play games. We can begin to bridge the harm into healing. And it became the most amazing thing to witness people who would walk in on a Friday and think to themselves, there's no way I can sit in space with someone who's a crime survivor after what happened to my son. And at the end of it, what would happen is we would become a family and we would create a community of survivors. So here's what I want to say to you. Victor Wooten, who's an, he's a famous, phenomenal bass player, says, everything that ever, ever, ever vibrated is still vibrating and everything that ever was still is. So at the end of the day, do you matter? The answer is yes. Everything you do and everything you say matters not just today and not just to you, but tomorrow and forever and to those who come behind you. Because at the end of the day and at the end of our lives, we are all here to walk each other home. Thank you and God bless. Uh -huh.